Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It finally happened. The Calgary Flames finally dipped into the well and brought up some guys from the farm team. We all knew it was going to be sooner rather than later. And of course, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break it down with you. And we're joined this week by friend of the show, longtime contributor, Kevin Olenek. Kevin, how you doing? I'm I'm really good. Good to be on. Good to see you, Dan. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, it's been an interesting week in Calgary. Um, I feel like there was a parade in uh, at City Hall uh, with balloons and and celebration and joy all across the land. As uh, with, the, with as a, a a young Calgary kid got to play a dream game on Saturday, and that that uh, kid is Matthew Phillips. Yes, it is. Yeah. Why, why don't we uh, – we'll talk about that in just a second. Before we get there, I do want to give everyone some good news. Uh, for those that don't know, Assistant General Manager Chris Snow of the Calgary Flames was admitted to hospital Thursday. It sounded like he was in pretty bad shape. He was on a ventilator. He wasn't breathing himself by himself. Good news. Um, it was reported today on Sunday that Chris is now off the ventilator. I guess he told his wife after he came off that he did it. And uh, it sounds like he's kicked out once again. And Chris Snow will be an integral part of the organization for the rest of the year. So congrats to the Snow family. Um, that's important. Chris has gone through a lot. And what a an inspirational guy to have on this roster. And uh, just best wishes to the Snow family uh, through the holiday season. And, you know, every time news about uh, him, I think everybody in Flames Nation is worried about him and concerned about him and his well-being and his family's well-being. So uh, I think we're all just relieved. I think that's something about the Sea of Red, right? I mean, we love the players here. We love the front office staff here. Like, these fans are really attached to everyone that makes this team run. Yeah. I think the hockey community, too, uh, as as well. I think a lot of fans, a lot of people are just really pulling for Chris. Um, It's a devastating disease. Uh, we did lose Borea Salming to this disease not, uh, what, two week, two or three weeks ago uh, in a pretty emotional ceremony uh, in Toronto uh, also. Uh, so I think the knowledge of this disease is big. Um, you know, Kelsey is so strong. Uh, I think it's just a lot of – there's a lot of courage from, from both of them. And I think the hockey community, not only the Flames, which I agree with you, Flames community as a whole, but the hockey community as a whole has really stepped in and, and is pulling for, for this family. So – very true. The Flames continue their run of pedestal power. Kevin, that's what we've been calling it, as the Flames have been looking really good wearing these new pedestal jerseys. They got another win at home against the, I don't know if we can say dastardly, but uh, I guess road-weary at this point, Phoenix Coyotes with a 3-2 to two win. Uh, Matt, why don't we go to you first for some thoughts? Well, uh, this was a typical game against the Arizona Coyotes where – it was painful to watch because it was extremely boring <laughs> uh, throughout most of the contest. And it seemed like both teams were just playing sloppy hockey throughout the contest and uh, Calgary got the win and, you know, which is to be expected against Arizona, but uh, it was not a pretty two points. It's the Arizona Coyotes and yeah, yeah, it wasn't a uh, wasn't a masterpiece. Uh, they got off to a slow start. It was fortunate that they were playing the Arizona Coyotes and they found a way to get themselves on the track there uh, and get the win. Uh, but there, so I think fortunate, but at a, at a expected win. Uh, but I imagine, you know, I think every team is when they're facing the Arizona Coyotes right now are finding it really hard to play against a team that is not. There's not a lot of talent on there, and they do just bore you to death. So, yeah, it, and this is a team. If I, if I remember the these guys have been playing like 14 on the road in a row or something. They have played the least amount of home games uh, in the National Hockey League. They've played their fifth on Friday, so they've played five home games uh, as they're getting that new arena all set up. Um. And, and yeah, so there's going to be a lot more home games, uh, but yeah, they're very road weary. That's uh, it's, that was a brutal schedule for Arizona for sure. Though, you know, I mean, with that arena, the way it is, I don't know if anybody's going to miss not being at home. At least they're playing actual NHL buildings. True. 
True. Where, where's my rim shot sound effect? Yeah. Well, it, it's one of those things that um, it it is a good place for young NHLers to try and get an opportunity to, you know, maybe cement themselves in the NHL. And we did see a couple of their young guys play rather well in the contest. But yeah, th- this is a team where it's going to take four or five or six years for them to dig their way out of being irrelevant. Do you know one one guy I do think gets these deserves a little bit more cr- uh, credit is their goaltender Carl Belmont. Uh, yeah, I agree. He's a he's a really good goalie. Like if I was a team that needed to look at some goaltending at the trade deadline, that would be a guy I would be highly considered. I mean, look at the shot volume that he's already facing, and are and behind this bad team. Um, I don't know. I think that this is a guy that could steal a series for someone. Yeah, he's yeah. he's very inconsistent. Sometimes, like, he is very bad. But, um, you know, look at the team in front of him. It's hard, you know, like, if you're not being, basically being perfect, you're going to get blown out. Uh, but I agree with you. Like, he looks like a young, good young and up-and-coming goaltender, which um, we'll see. I, I, I think if he got a better defense in front of him, that you're right, he could be a very good goaltender in this league. Yeah. And then the next game the Flames played was also wearing their pedestal jersey. And again, a win with the pedestal. Maybe we're onto something here. Maybe we should just revert back to these 90s jerseys full time. Uh, the Calgary Flames get a 5-3 win over the Minnesota Wild. Why don't we start with you, Kevin, this time? What was your thoughts on this one? Well, I think ultimately this game, even though it was a win, uh, was this, turned out to be a pretty significant game in terms of making some th- decisions within this organization. Uh, the fourth line of uh, Lewis, Lucic, and Richie played uh, about six, five to six minutes. Didn't get much work after the first period. Um, they got off to a release. They got it was two nothing within the first five minutes. They they got some power play opportunities, uh, and Lindholm got three assists, and they got finally found a way to turn things around. But in terms of where this the trajectory of this week ended up. This game, I think, will be looked back upon as a pretty significant one where uh, I think that the I think Daryl Sutter recognized that there was a, a I'm pushing I'm, I'm moving a little bit ahead, but I'm just going to say that just in terms of this game, I think Daryl Sutter recognized where this team was at and there needed to be a change. Yeah, um, well, you could see it quite clearly that like the Flames were basically running three lines after the first five minutes of the game. And very spotty action for the fourth line after that. And I thought it was a very good, resilient effort by the Flames to, like, after they went down 2 nothing to kind of shut the door on Minnesota for the rest of the game and eventually get their mojo back, especially in the sec- early part of the second period. But, um, no, that fourth line, like, even on our show last week, we were talking uh, with Mike Gold about... Um, like how uh, guys like Lou Cheech and uh, Lewis and Richie and Rooney have all kind of struggled to varying degrees this year. And, you know, like it, it started to look like it was becoming more of a need to get different personnel out there. And this week, it, and especially in this game, it, yeah, like those players are mostly not playing at an NHL level. And with the Calgary Wranglers being so dominant, it just makes sense to make some personnel changes. Well, the personnel changes were made after this game. If you looked out, you could have seen across the sky, just like when they summoned Batman, the Wranglers logo, downtown Calgary, as help was called for. And uh, after this game, some interesting uh, lineup changes, not all at once, but essentially Matthew Phillips and Radham Zahorno were recalled from Stockton and Kevin Rooney placed on waivers and then sent down to Stockton all happened kind of Thursday, Friday, just in time for the Columbus game. Um, and in this Columbus game, Radham Zahorna made his flames debut. He was in the lineup uh, replacing Brett Ritchie in this one. Um, and he centered a line with Milan Lucic and Trevor Lewis playing six minutes, 34 seconds and 10 shifts in a losing effort to Johnny Goudreau and the, uh, and the Columbus Blue Jackets. You know, I'll say this here. I think Columbus got embarrassed the night before or the game before. They were not going to get embarrassed again. I don't think they played a great game, though. No, this was, uh, in my opinion, a uh, lack of professionalism by the Calgary Flames this whole game. Um, 
How so? They hung out with Johnny the night before. And a bunch of players... You, you could even tell Daryl was unhappy with that in the yeah, press conference. Yeah, it, it's like, it, yeah, your buddies are not on this team anymore. And, you know, like, there's absolutely zero excuse for that quality of effort. Like, it's fine to go to hang out with the guy for a bit. But not when it's impacting your ability to actually play hockey the next day. And, like, the the team was garbage throughout the contest. Like, there's absolutely no reason they should have lost to Columbus uh, and play as badly as they did. And, like, I'm sure that, you know, and I'm sure that, uh, like, if uh, the Flames weren't in the lineup the the next day, that Daryl probably would have bag-skated them after that one. Well, the and it, what was really unfortunate about that was you you did get a good performance from Jacob Markstrom. Yes, he allowed the first shot on goal again, but he um, he he found his footing. He played really well. He quite frankly kept the, the Flames in the game, uh, and they had no business that they had no business being in because you're right, Matt. They they there was a lack of professionalism. It was a lack of uh, just. Uh, they, as Daryl Sutter used the words, they they went to Columbus for a visit. And I, other than Johnny Gaudreau, I'm trying to think of a tourist attraction in Columbus that would would be an excuse to have such a lackluster effort like that. But I guess it did. Uh, maybe they went and hung out at Ohio State. I have no idea. But you know, I think what's frustrating. Well, if, if it was. Uh... If it was Dougie Hamilton, it probably would have been the Columbus Museum. Yeah, maybe. Of Art. Yes, it maybe maybe it would have been the Columbia Museum of Art for sure. Uh, but yeah, like a team getting on a roll like this, um, getting trying to get yourself better, and quite frankly, let's face it, where the Flames are in a play a battle for their playoff lives, you have to come up. This that's a game you need to grab. That's a that's a scheduled win that you need to grab two points. And depending on what happens during the end of the season, we may look at that, at that game and go, that's a, that was a waste of, that was a poor, poor effort there. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things that like, it, I can understand um, like certain teams being able to let their foot off the gas a bit. Like there was uh, I remember what, reading a thing that Scotty Bowman mentioned about uh, coaching the Canadians in the seventies. And they used to treat the LA trip as like a, just a vacation and who cares if we're playing hockey, we're just there to, Oh, sunlight. Yay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, you know, Calgary's not in the position where you can just take, a game off and like who cares you know like we're yeah you guys have both said it i think with where the flames are every game has to be a battle if they were in a different spot maybe but you can't afford for that effort and that you know visit right now no yeah well and then the last game of the week was uh back to back um dan vladar went back in net as he was against arizona and minnesota and the calgary flames were in toronto to take on the maple leafs this was the Matthew Phillips uh, debut for this year. He's played one other game. He played kind of a meaningless game during the COVID season with nobody in the building, but he was able to play in this one, centering a line with Backlund and Rajishka. The Calgary Flames ended up losing 5-4 to four in overtime in this one. And Daryl Sutter, after the game, uh, slammed the officiating, but said his team put in a good effort. Kevin, would you agree with that? Did they put in a good effort? Mostly. I think in this case, good is relative, probably better, better than, the night, than the night before. They got off to another horrible start. They took, um, they took, they took far too many penalties. That simple. I sixteen. Yeah, penalty and minutes. there was only the two, the ones I didn't, the one I absolutely didn't like was the Backlund one uh, in the first period for cross checking. I didn't like that one because that puck should have been frozen in the first place, in my opinion. That um, Backlund was playing the puck. And the Huberto penalty in overtime, I I agreed with the Huberto penalty, but I also thought that Sandine should have got a high sticking penalty as well because both of their sticks got up on that one. So I I didn't really like those two, but everything else I didn't necessarily have a problem with the calls that Calgary was getting. Now I do think that there was a couple. There was a cross checking penalty early that I think it was Robert Munich put out on Twitter. That there was a blatant, there was a missed call that Toronto got for a similar that that was let go from Toronto on Toronto's side there, but um, still ultimately, uh, as as my pal Tyler says on shifts and pucks, you can't put the referees in a position to make a decision, and the Flames put the referees in positions where they had to make decisions. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know if I fully agreed with Daryl on this, but I I think that this was to cover. I think I think it was I think it was a masterful job at de- deflecting the conversation into something else. Yeah, this yeah this is one that? of those where like the Calgary penalties, like uh, uh, them being called in the way they were. Uh, yeah, like the Backlund one was kind of questionable. The overtime one again, kind of you know on the fence with but it was more that like i think toronto deserved maybe another two penalties in the game like the that uh when coleman had the breakaway in the first period that could have been called a hook um and you know like it just plays like that where uh, you know and anytime you're allowing that many penalties and you're just giving toronto it's just like when you give the Oilers too many power plays. You know, you're going to see McDavid score. You're going to see Matthews score. You're going to see Marner score. Like, you know, like it's, you know, last night it was Nylander going off on a five-point night. It, it, it's one of those where you you need to have mental discipline. And I, I think that the Flames, you know, like they could recognize that the team, the refs were going to call them closely all night off of the early power plays so that's where you need to have the mental responsibility uh frankly to okay well if they're gonna call everything that we do don't do anything stupid (laughs) and you know like the last uh six minutes of regulation they had to kill off two penalties and then one right off the hop in overtime and it's like you're just trying to give the game away at that point like if you're not gonna have any discipline like you know, it, it was a very poor effort on that part from them. Well, the only well, the other one just that I was sort of thinking about is the Vladar trip. I've seen other, I've seen that not be called, and that's pretty yeah. like that one. I that's the other one that I maybe I could be, I would be of well, about. But like, can I just ask a question here though? Was Sutter complaining about the officiating, or was Sutter trying to? Because the words were basically, I've been here long enough since my days in Chicago to know what happens when we're in Toronto. It felt, kind of felt like he was trying to say something else um, subtly here, which I I know that Leaf and Zer and Leaf meet. Sutter, Sutter and Subtle don't no. usually go together. Yeah, that's true. Sutter, Sutter is blatantly saying something here, and he's, he's trying to stay out of tr- trouble, I guess. But He's not talking about the Toronto no, nightlife, no. right? Um. Like, let's, I don't know how to address this, but Toronto is a national brand. And I, I do think there is times in some of these bigger cities, and you'd see it in other sports. I mean, it was often in Montreal at the forum over the years. People found it was weird how calls kind of turned out. Um, I don't know if I, I think in that specific game, I can't say that he, he's, I don't agree with him, but sometimes it does feel, it feels like there are some strange calls that often go against visiting teams in some of those bigger markets. And I sort of can see what he, he is kind of saying. I don't fully agree, but you know, uh, well, it's sort of like uh, any time a, a team goes and plays in Yankee Stadium, you know that the umpires are going to be calling the game differently. Yeah. And, it, you know, it it's slightly that, but it, it's just frustrating because I think, like, on the overall, like, Toronto probably deserved two more penalties than they got, and Calgary probably deserved on the whole one or two less than they got. And, like, it was a very even game, I thought, in terms of, like, overall discipline. But yet the game was called wildly different between the two teams. And I think that's more what he was getting at is that, like, because it wasn't like Calgary was just, like, playing rock'em, sock'em hockey and, you know, just being stupid out there. But, you know, it, but you know you look at the penalty differential and you would assume it was that kind of a game and it, it just it you know there was a little bit weird a lot of the penalties for calgary were not rock and sock and penalties they were undisciplined mm-hmm. penalties no i guess the only other i um i thought a better effort overall 
Um, but um, this is um, this is where I think this was one of those games though, where I don't think we've talked about this enough overall in Flamesland, and I don't think Flame fans want to hear this. But maybe Dan and I, I know we were on the same page on this. I don't know where you are, Matt, but I think the Flames miss Eric Gustafson more than a lot of. Or Eric Gerbranson, pardon me. Eric Gerbranson, I always get the name confused. Or Eric Gerbranson more. I don't think we knew Gustafson yeah. long enough to miss him. Uh, I think we miss. I think the Flames miss Eric Gerbranson a lot more than I think the Flames realize. And I'm not saying that they should have paid him what Columbus did. But that Tanev Zadorov penalty killing pair is not as effective as Tar- Tanev and Gerbranson were last year. Um, just I, I think Gerbranson is a much better penalty killer. Um, he seemed to be able to get people away from the front of the net. Um, he responded really well to Tanov. And I, I, that is one that was, I was, when I was watching that game and just watching how the Leafs were moving that power run in the power play, I was, uh, that was one game that reminded me. I think, I think that that's a different result if Eric Gabranson's there. And, and the other side of that, just go back to that Columbus visit. Does that Columbus visit happen if Eric Gabranson's in the room? Because the last year we didn't, we have very, very rarely had a conversation about unprofessionalism with the Calgary Flames. True. Um, yeah, but I think Calgary's in a very different scenario this year too. Last year Calgary didn't lose a top guy. That no, that's liked. true. That's true. Uh, no, I agree. But I, I, I think this is one of those that everybody within the analytics and everybody. Th- that loves the scorer, you know, and like kind of looks down and poo poos on it, what Eric Gabranson brought to the team. And there's, he's, he's not a perfect hockey player. There were a lot of flaws. We saw that against the Oilers for sure, but he did bring a lot that the flames have not found a way to replace. No. And I, I find that teams generally that are more successful tend to have just big guys on defense that can clear out the front of the net. And, as you mentioned, like losing Good Branson, uh, that removed a, a good portion of muscle from the blue line, and you know, like Stone and uh, other guys have replaced uh, the rest of the game rather effectively, but that that just raw physicality is missing from the lineup. Yep. You know, and even on the Good Branson side, I don't disagree with with you guys, but I think. Calgary is just missing a defenseman. And I think, you know, if we look at the roster and Matt and I've talked about this, Shillington was penciled in there for whatever reason, he's not here. I think whether it's good Branson or somebody else, we're missing an NHL. Yeah. Yeah. And Michael Stone played. So we're definitely feeling And Michael Stone only played five minutes uh, against Toronto. 533. Yeah. And Stone, uh, he started off good, but he's sliding backwards a bit. And I think this is one of those where, like, the Flames, if they're making the playoffs, definitely need to address just getting a serviceable guy uh, for the third pairing. And, you know, uh, you know, it, even if it's another guy like a Derek Forbort, uh, um, like, that's fine. You know, and we're saying Stone's going backwards, Matt. Is he regressing or is he, re- is he going back to his mean? To me, he's been asked to play more yeah. than he should be this year to me right now when i look at him he's looking like a number sure. seven yeah he's he's a number seven at best and he says he's a servo civil six more seven he's a fill-in guy but you can't play him the the amount that you play he's a six yeah. and a pinch mm-hmm. well with those four games out of the way the calgary flames are still uh, not where they want to be right now fifth in the pacific division at 30 points 13 11 and four is their record uh above them is edmonton at 32 points la at 35 seattle at 35 and vegas at 41 so still some climbing to do there um but guys let's talk about these call-ups the flames finally did it we've been calling for these call-ups to happen for how long now and and they finally did it um it it finally happened we got where we needed to be we got the guys in the roster i'll start with you kevin and i'll ask you both the same question do you think these are, are guys that are going to, in, in Zahorna and Phillips, they're going to stay on the Flames roster, or do they play here for less than 30 days and get sent back to the AHL? Well, I, I actually was pretty impressed overall with Zahorna. Uh, I thought he brought a lot of muscle and skill, and he has he, he's made a couple plays. 
uh, that I think at the very least he deserves a lengthier look uh, for sh- there, that I'd like to see a little bit more from him. Uh, I thought in terms of Phillips, uh, he got better as the game went on. I, you know, um, I think we like. I'd like to see more from him, just in terms of of what he can do and what he can bring. Um, I think it's all going to depend on what the results are. I think if it's, I think if the Flames start kind of continuing to win, I think that you could see Zahorna and Phillips staying stick it around but if it's more of the same 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 or it, it's a regression back i i i wonder what's going to happen i mean um but to me i uh, yeah i i'm i'm sort of in a wait to wait and see mode with both of them i like i liked what i saw but i want to see what i want to see a little bit more we've got uh we've got some divisional games and we've got some interconference games coming up here that I think we're going to tell that will tell us a lot more where the flames are at. Yeah. And I, I agree. The, the first uh, checkpoint basically for the two players, they met it. Uh, I think that, you know, they played adequately enough in the games that they appeared. Um, but it's like, as, as Kevin was saying, like we just need to see more. And like, if Phillips can start putting some points on the board, and like Zahorna maybe as well, then I, the more that they do, the more that they'll entrench themselves in the lineup. And if they don't, then we could see them getting reassigned back down. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. I think in baseball, they call it wins against replacement. But if these guys are better than the guys they're replacing, they'll stick around. If they're not, they won't. Is that kind of a fair way yeah. to say this? Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised that Milan Lucic came out of the lineup. I mean, this is a very Daryl Sutter player, and I kind of expected Daryl would maybe play Lucic more than he should because he's a very Daryl Sutter player. So I want to give Daryl credit for taking Milan out of the lineup. We talked about this last week on the show with Mike Gold that, you know, maybe it's time for Lucic to come out. I think if I look at these two, I can see Zahorna sticking around in the Lucic role and making Lucic the extra forward. Um, I think... Phillips has more to prove on this team and more that he has to do to stick around. I think it's an easy thing to just keep Zahorna here and play that big man, big body. I mean, he's what, six foot seven. Um, he is 220 pounds. So, you know, bigger kid that I think they could keep around just because of that. But I think Phillips is going to really have to work hard. And you have to ask what's best for Phillips. Is it to go back to the AHL and be the big fish in a small pond? Or is it stay in the NHL and be literally the smallest fish in the big pond? What does Phillips have to prove to you? I don't think he has to prove anything to me, but he has to prove, I think, to the coaching staff that if he's staying on a third line role, which is where he is, I think that he can keep up at the NHL and that it's not going to hinder his development. Yeah, for me, I think that Phillips just needs to start establishing himself as a actual NHL player now. Because when you're tearing up the A like you have been for like the last year and a half, it, he's 24 like it, there's not really any more road down there for him where he hasn't already hit all the highs that he can uh, are you an NHL player or are you a quality yeah, player and the, you can only really get that verdict by playing up here and you know if he struggles at the NHL level and like say we're talking like 10 games from now assuming he stays up for that long and he has like say three points then you're like, well, I don't think that you're quite NHL caliber right at the moment. But, you know, if he's at like seven or eight points or more, you know, because you never know, um, then you're like, oh, well, you're firmly establishing yourself as an actual player worthy of ice time, and maybe you should get more responsibilities. But, you know, that will literally be all on Phillips and how he plays. I mean, considering that Phillips is up and uh, and Rooney's down, do you think guys think it's fair to say? And the fact that Phillips kind of supplanted Coleman in the lineup, do you think it's fair to say Phillips has to be better than Coleman and Rooney to stay? Yeah. Yes, he does. Yep, he did. He and does. I think, and I think maybe that's the push there. Is you know, Matthew, be better than Blake, and you stick. Well, around. and I think this is also a message to like the whole team, frankly, of. You guys have basically been playing lousy for the first 26 games. And, you know, like, this kind of stuff's not acceptable. 
And so we're going to start making roster adjustments accordingly. And and Daryl Sutter said that, Matt, in I forget which press conference. They all kind of blur together to me. Old man in front of Banner after a while. You forget when he says what. But he kind of said there was no competition in his eyes coming out of training camp. So now they're trying that to was sure, that was yeah, That was the Toronto game. That was a Toronto. That's why we keep you around, Kevin. Um, Not just because of my good looks, eh? Uh, that's <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what they're doing is they're creating that competition. And you know, I, I agree with Matt, and we've had this discussion, and Kevin, we've had this discussion on your show, Shifts and Pucks. I don't know if Phillips is a bona fide Angeler. I think he's showing he's too good for the AHL. I don't know that he's ready to join a, let's call it a team built for the playoffs in the national hockey league. I think he's got to prove that. Yeah. And I think even at, like right now, all we can say is, well, here's your shot kid. Have fun. And you know, if you sink, that's your problem. If you swim, that's great. I think everything that happens to, to Phillips at this point is on Matthew yeah. Phillips. Matthew Phillips will decide Matthew Phillips yeah. fate. Now, the other way to look at this, though, too, is maybe Matthew Phillips becomes a bit of a trade ship to get that established forward that you are missing in that lineup or a a piece that you're missing in that lineup in terms of a prospect. And if he plays well enough, that can attract to some trade, trade value, maybe, too. Um, because ultimately, I guess the question will always be is if Matthew Phillips will be a Daryl Sutter guy. And I'm, I'm not sure where I'm at with that. I, I've, I, I think that Daryl is a bit more ahead of his time than, than a lot of people give him credit for. He is he stubborn? Sure. But he's given people opportunities if they've earned it. Like we look at Adam Ruzicka. I mean, it took a little while, but Adam Ruzicka is now finding his way. Oliver Shillington last year, he found his way. Uh, so, I mean, if Phillips does his thing, I think that Daryl will be – I don't think Daryl is going to look at this guy and say, well, he's 5'8", I don't – or 5-whatever, and I no, won't play if he, him. If he can produce to the NHL level, any coach, including Daryl, is smart enough to know you got to keep him on the roster. Yeah. But it's interesting uh, you mentioned that, Kevin. I've been thinking about that. I'm thinking, you know what? I think they've got to see, and Matt's mentioned that at the end of the year, the Flames lose their controlling rights to Matthew Phillips. Um, I think the Flames just see what they've got here. And is this a player that's going to help us, or is this a player that can help us by being here or by being traded for something else? And I would not be surprised if Matthew Phillips was included as part of a deal at the deadline if the Flames think that's where his usefulness is, because I think they could get something for him. Yeah, if he if he produces, I think that there would be a couple of teams that would take a a, a little bit of a look at him for sure. You're yeah. not getting Brock Besser for him, but you might be able to recoup some picks. Yeah, yeah, I would. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens at the deadline. I think there's a few teams with a a number of different questions, but. Um, I think playing him with a guy like Michael Backlund, I think Backlund is a good player to establish uh, yourself with. Um, he's he's a def- he's a the best. Pro- well, I'm, no, not I'll, I'll re-say it. He is. How do I word this? I wouldn't say he's the best all round forward on the team, but he's the most reliable forward on the team. He's the most consistent at times. One of those guys like you can put someone with Backlund, and your game will get going and you'll understand the game of hockey. Like, he just plays it in a certain way that it makes sense for people. So it's that was, I think, good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens there. I, I think it's going to be inter- – it's going to be a very interesting argument going forward with Matthew Phyllis because I think there's going to be people that will defend him to the end, and that's totally fair. You have every right to do that. But I think ultimately – We'll have to be honest at the end of this, this assessment of where he's at. And, Matt, uh, do you think that Phillips is in the right spot in the lineup right now? Yeah, uh, I think that like sheltering him a bit on the third line and having Backlund and Rashidska, who are both bigger than him, and uh, Backlund definitely being more defensively responsible um, allows Phillips the, the maneuverability to do his thing. And... You know, having him out on the second power play unit also makes a ton of sense. Like, he actually nearly got his first point in the the game yesterday. 
uh, when Manjapane uh, fired one off the post. And it's one of those where, you know, if he can keep doing that and contributing on the power play, then that'll be great. And like, I actually last night when overtime started, I was hoping that we would see Phillips out there for a shift because he had that uh, assist on uh, Stone's overtime game winning goal in the preseason. And, you know, he has shown that kind of creativity. So we'll see. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those where we're at a point where literally nobody knows what the answer will be. And, uh, you know, like I've been a very ardent supporter of Phillips in this lineup and, you know, wanting him recalled for a while now. And, like, even if, like, after 10 games, like, he's not producing, then even, like, I'll be, yeah, well, it, it's just not working out right now. You got to give him a fair shake and see what happens, but you can't be overly invested in the result. Yep. I mean, I, I don't have a necessarily, I mean, Dan, you mentioned getting Lucic out of the lineup, and you were surprised about that. I guess the other question about all of this is, I don't, and maybe it's me, but I I am not been one that has thought has thought that Brett Ritchie has been all that bad this no. year. Like in terms of the fourth the fourth line, I think that they've been, you know, I, I haven't expected much from them. Um, and I I mean Brett Ritchie has five goals. I I don't think I mean there was there's been a time there he was ahead of Dylan both Dubé and Andre Mangiapane with goals in, in this year. I don't like I do also think you got to keep Richie. You got to find a way to keep Brett Richie in this lineup as well too. Right. Um, like if, if we're about people earning ice time, Brett Richie has earned ice time. And yeah, of the four guys that, uh, have been the fourth line, uh, between Lucic, Lewis, Richie and Rooney, uh, Richie has been the only consistently good one out of the bunch. Uh, Lewis has been okay. And the other two, not so much. And I mean, no. I don't think Blake Coleman's a fourth line guy. I think he's there because that's where he fits right now. But I think Zahorna and Richie will end up sort of being your fourth line pairing, and it's a matter of who goes down there with them. Yeah, but at the same time, I do think it's it's fair that it's it, it is time to expect a little bit more from Blake Coleman. I don't think he's had that good of a year, to be honest with you. No, and I, I think, think that's he's, why he's, he's on the fourth line. Yeah um what he's got what like i mean yeah he's got the same amount of goals as brett ritchie but i don't feel like he's had a huge impact on the year no no it, it, sporadic for him more so than anything when we talk about guys and what we've got there uh we did get a fan question this week actually another friend of the show kevin your co-host on the shifts and pucks podcast sean beardy cannot go three on twitter asked us and matt and i've debated this a lot what is Dylan Dubé? So why don't I start with my thoughts here and then I'll throw to you guys. I've said since I think, you know, Dubé came to the NHL, I don't see this guy as a top six. I think Dubé is a bottom six guy, probably a third line winger at best, a replacement top six when you need him to for a short term. But I think Dubé is in over his head right now simply because we don't have a winger. And I can see this lineup shaking down where either Phillips or Rujicka becomes the winger with Kadri and Manjapani. I can see Dubé then either landing on the third line or replacing Coleman on the fourth line and shifting Coleman up. But I, I just, I don't think the Dubé is what some fans think he is being that top six guy. I know, you know, Matt's been a big fan of Dubé's, but I just, I think you're, you're going to see him max out in his career as a, as a, you know, third line winger. Kevin, what do you think? I think the skill of Dylan Dubé is there. Uh, when he is on, I he and him and Andrew Budget that that the Flames have been better. It's no coincidence that this the the team has started winning when this the Kadri Dubé Bonjapani line has played as well. And for what it's worth, I edge for what the expectations have been. I'm gonna really just need to emphasize this. For what the expectations have been, and until a couple weeks ago, I would argue that the Kadri Dubé Manjapani line has been the worst line on the team for what was expected. Like you could argue the fourth line was worse, but I mean, in terms of what you need from them, it's below expectation. But you're not expecting much. I would argue with Kadri Dubé Manjapani, it's been much lower than expected. But when Dubé is on, um, I think he is a six-seven. Uh, not always a top six, but a guy that you can replace. But 
Ultimately, I think I would say he is a third line on a good team. He's a third line, kind of a JT Comfort type of guy that you can fit in in situations when you need a replacement. But ultimately, if you're going to win a championship, he's in your third line. Yeah. What do you but mean, at NHL, yeah, I, I agree. And like with both Manjapane and Dubé, like we've seen each of them struggle uh, mightily throughout the course of the season. And uh, Dubé looked like as he was engaging a lot more physically towards the end of last season that uh, he would uh, establish himself more because like he knew what it would take to be successful. And like it was doing that consistently in the last month of last year. But then, like, what we're seeing is, like, the first few months of uh, Dylan Dubé last year where he was the just their guy and, like, it, you know, who Sutter eventually benched for a few games. Dylan Dubé is not a bad player. He's a serviceable NHL player, I think, in your bottom six. Like Kevin said, when he turns it on, you get great offense. And I think teams are willing to pay for that potential of that offense, especially in the playoffs. But I think when we're looking at our top six here, I think the fact that Dubé's still in it still shows the flames of a hole there. Yeah, and frankly, like I'd like to see Phillips and Dubé switch at some point. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I've said this for a while. Kevin, you were mentioning maybe having uh, Phillips as a trade chip. I've said for a couple of years, I think Dubé could be a trade chip for this team. I don't, I don't know what the value is for him, though. Like, I don't he, think him by himself, but I, you know, I think if you're trying to put together some sort of package, you could move Dubé as part of it. I don't know. I, I do. You, I, I, do you mean as like these the principal piece of this package that a team is getting back? No. Let's say the Flames were going to move, say, a pick, like they did last year, say for Yarn Croak. You might move, say, a pick and Dubé to free up some cap space um, for you know one one player coming back. Maybe you're not yeah. going to need to pay. Let's just say you're not going to need to pay somebody to take Dubé off our hands. If you needed to move money or move, you know, bodies, I think you, you wouldn't have to pay someone to take him like you might with some other guys in this team. But don't you think the flames have tried to trade Dubé? I think so. Yeah. But you know, markets always change, right? Yeah, it's kind of hard under like everything that's happened the, the over the last calendar year where uh, like I don't really think that anybody's safe other than the new guys with the long-term contracts and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, yeah, I I I'm not saying that not to trade Dubé, that's not what I'm saying. Uh but um I I Let's, let me put this scenario out there, Kevin. So let's say Phillips stays in the lineup and Rajishka stays in the lineup. The Flames go out of the deadline and get somebody. Patrick Kane has been a name that Matt's mentioned. They get somebody. You have an odd man out. I think you could flip Dubé at that point for even a, a third or fourth and get some value mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah, no, I can I can see that. I I just I, I we keep having this conversation though, and I I just I I just wonder if we as Flame fans overrate him a little bit. Um, I feel like he's got a little bit of a. Uh, this is this sort of reminds me of the Yessi Puyarvi argument in Edmonton, where I think Flame fans think he's better than he actually is. I think that's fair. Like, and I mean. Like, look, like, look, let's let's be honest here. Dubé went 16 games without a goal, and I don't think for what Dubé is getting paid for, I don't think that that's remotely ex ex uh, acceptable. At and all. I think and Flames I, fans have always been high on the guys they draft and develop, and I think maybe he's getting a longer leash with fans because of that, because he's you know a Flames born and bred guy. Yeah, and I know that that's something I think that fans always do, right? Is they defend the guy that you bring into the lineup. I mean, we look at that Yusuf Valamaki. Yusuf Valamaki was a guy that I think a lot of Flame fans defended because he was he was a Flames pro. He was a Flames uh, he was Flames developer, but um, ultimately he wasn't a fit with Daryl Sutter, and I think it was best for him to move on. Um, I think we're seeing the same with Dubé, but I just i I don't know. I think it's really – I think the reason that Sean asked that question is is it's really hard to kind of figure out – it's a mystery to figure out what Dubé is because there is skill enough for him to be a top six forward. I feel like there's something 
between his ears that is missing. And I just, just something about him as a person, I mean, like whatever his mental game right now is not where it needs to be. No, but whether really, they, I would argue hasn't been since he turned pro. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, I mean, he's 24. He's still a young guy. And, you know, I mean, we're seeing Zahorna or not Zahorna. Um, we're seeing Adam Rzichka figure it out. And as Matt's mentioned, you know, a big knock of, of Rzichka's in junior was inconsistency. So maybe Dylan will get together. But I guess how long do you give him to try and do that? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that leash has went on far too long. And I think that this was one of the things that kind of bugged me about the whole Lucic, Lewis, Richie argument about everybody was talking about how bad that fourth line was. Is I don't think that there was enough criticism about Kadri, Dubé, and Manjapani overall. Like, um, I don't think Manjapani, I mean, I'm, Manjapani has been better, but it's he hasn't been good this year. And Dubé no. has not been good enough. They, they've both been not nearly good enough. And the problem with them not being productive is it hasn't really allowed Jonathan Huberto to get his game together. I, you know, I mean, I know that Huberto is struggling, but if Dubé and Manjapani were scoring more goals, that would allow Huberto to kind of be able to easily gel himself in. But you can kind of see, and you saw that, yes, and again, certainly in the Toronto game, I saw it. He's getting, he's, get, he's starting to get frustrated, right? So I think ultimately it, it is time for Dubé to get that to get that push. And I've been an advocate that uh, there's a legitimate argument to scratch Dylan Dubé. I think that that's something, you know, I think that it has to be something on the table here, especially and if you're getting something out of Ruzichka and you're getting, you're going to play Phillips. Um, Maybe Dubé needs to sit a couple of games and 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 figure it out. Um, and maybe that's what Matthew Phillips is being told: is you know what, show us we can put you in that Dubé spot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So hopefully, Sean, we've answered that question. If not, let us know and we can readdress it next week. Um, another guy, though, I think we should discuss the future of is Kevin Rooney. Kevin Rooney was a. We were all waiting to see after Johnny Goudreau left who the Flames sign on day one of free agency. Who do the Flames sign on day one of free agency? And they go out and sign Kevin Rooney to a two-year deal, one point three million per year. I think it was more than I expect him to be, and a year longer than I expect it to be. And now we see him in the AHL. Kevin, do you think that uh, Kevin Rooney is going to come back to the NHL this year? Um, do you think that he, you know, let's say barring injury, or do you think he's probably an AHL player for the remainder of the year? Well, first of all, I think that I wasn't as upset about the Kevin Rooney signing as other people. I just think that that's that kind of reminded me. I mean, it may, is it a first first day, second day, early free agent signing? I don't. I mean, I wasn't opposed you know, to signing itself. I just don't think that you should have given him one point three for two years. Yeah, I. I I I was kind of rooting for Kevin Rooney because I you know I, I think he was kind of caught in a bit of a rough spot. He was he was the guy that ended up replacing Johnny Goodrow in terms of the perception of like this is the massive move, and everybody was really upset in July first and all of that. And I was more um, you know I I wanted to give him a shot. He hasn't been good enough this year. I will grant you that, but I I still think we see, I still think you need him. I really do. Like, I, I think that there's stuff that he, you know, I think, you know, I think when if he can get his game back, he can be a good face-off guy. He can be a very serviceable fourth-line guy. Um, and put in utility situations that, you know, I think he can help. Um, is it working out for him at this particular point in time? No. Uh, will a time in the AHL help him? Probably, but you know, I think I still think they'll need him. I, I really do. I don't think that this is like I, I think that he has a lot to offer. It just hasn't quite worked out yet. I would agree with you, and I think we'll see him back here. I think you he needs some time to get his game together. He needs some time to figure out maybe what he is. I think that the Flames by playoffs will have him back on the roster because I think that, like you said, they need him there. And I think he had to be sent down for one of these two guys to come up. And it's going to be a matter of, I guess, who they, you know, who they would want to move to bring him back onto this team. Cause they would need to make a move at this point to get rid of somebody. 
but I think you're right. He's he's a good veteran. I thought he was fine when they brought him in for the role they were asking him to play. Mm-hmm. If you're asking him to be a Johnny Goudreau replacement, uh, that's not what you want. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, for a fourth-line center, yeah, I think he mm-hmm. deserves a spot here. But I think, you know, if we're going with the guys who've earned it, I think they were right to send him to the American League right now. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he has – yeah, I don't think it was a wrong decision at all. Yeah, I, I don't think he's, it's been a wrong decision. I, I'm still pulling for him. I still think there's something to offer. Um, I mean, let, let, let's look at it here. I mean, he had a – one of the games in the last little while here, he sets up Lucic for a, uh, a perfect pass. Lucic shoots it right into the, right into the goalie's crest. Uh, into the into the like right into the middle of the crest there so like he's I, I i don't know i i think that there's more to give there i really i really do maybe I'm, and i think and i think maybe to I'm get stubborn, him but... back someone else is gonna have to falter would you disagree okay if okay can he do more to me to me this comes down to i guess the debate to me of in terms of role this is a Kevin Rooney or Trevor Lewis role, right? Because Lewis kills penalties. That's been the argument of why you're keeping Trevor Lewis in the lineup is he's killing penalties. So if Rooney is is proven to be an effective penalty killer, I would think that ends up to be you debate whether Rooney or Lewis is that forward. And and then you have... Daryl also, mean, one of his things for bringing in Lewis too was the playoff experience. Sure, but does that but at the same time going forward in the playoffs do they have like to me the flames looked a lot more like on saturday they looked a lot more they played with a lot more pace than they have in the last little while with that fourth the the what i've effectively called the law firm of lewis lucic and richie they've looked a lot more in pace with that i like i'm struggling a little bit my struggle is here to me and we had this conversation in the offseason i think trevor lou i don't think trevor lewis is a higher than a number 10 forward in the national hockey league now i think he's a serviceable 11 12 but i also think that kevin rooney can be a guy that in a pinch you can put in a top 10 roll like 10 9 roll third line for uh, like not regularly but he can be a guy if there's injured i think that he can fill that spot i think he's got the speed to do it he has like a kind of a he has that ability to be a a, a faster swiss army knife than daryl sutter is deploying trevor lewis to be if that makes sense that's fair well, I guess only time will tell what happens with Kevin Rooney and if he makes it back to the NHL roster or not. Um, but while we're thinking about guys that may or may not be on the Flames NHL roster, there's been some interesting discussion this week from Calgary uh, Flames and Vancouver Canucks camps about the Flames may be sniffing around on Brock Besser. And Kevin, I know you also cover the Canucks on shifts and pucks. Can you give us some background on where this comes from? Okay, so yeah, let's start from the beginning here. Uh, so uh, last week, Brock Besser was scratched, uh, was a, uh, scheduled to be a healthy scratch for the game against the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, the and you know that was the at the morning skate. It was supposed to be Dakota Joshua taking over for the lineup for Brock Besser. According to Bruce Boudreaux, after the game, he ends up Besser ends up playing, ends up getting the tying goal. And according to uh, Boudreaux, Dakota Joshua got hurt and Besser ended up being in the lineup. Now, the whole controversy around this specifically with Besser is that was Hockey Fights Cancer Night. And so Brock has been very upfront and very vulnerable about his father, Duke, who passed away this year. He passed away from Parkinson's, uh, but uh, he did battle cancer as well. So it was a very emotional uh, time. And then Elliot Re- uh, Friedman reported on the 32 Thoughts second intermission that Besser Besser's camp has been granted permission to speak to other teams, which in loose translation means that the Canucks have tried to trade Brock Besser, but they haven't been able to do it. Uh, so that's what comes out of here and why 
we are in this situation where Brock Besser is apparent. Uh, Brock Besser is apparently on the block, and then Rick Dollywall said this week that the Flames were poking around on Brock Besser, and I don't think that Rick Dollywall would be saying reliable. anything that without that being yes, of course, everybody pokes around on everybody, but I do. Would believe that Dolly will there was some substance to it if if Rick Dolly will report. Yes, he's a reliable guy. Here's the situation. Brock Besser has four goals this year. Um, I know that he is a 20, 30 goal scorer, and, but um, you are in a position to be a healthy scratch. Uh, he has four goals this year. He he has struggled, especially defensively. Um, he made, he just signed a three year, six million dollar a year contract, six point five million dollar a year contract. I just from my perspective, from the Flames doing this, I don't see this as a fit. And it's only been, not only the contract, but you look at what the Flames have done here in terms of bringing all these new players in. Um, yeah, trying to get everybody adjusted and acclimatized, and that's been an issue. I mean, I think we can clearly agree that that's been an issue. Adding Besser into this entire mix, I don't know if that works for me. I just don't know where the Flames are at adding this piece. And the other thing about this is the trade value. Um, you know, I think that this is an Oliver similar. I think to me, any other team that is not in the Pacific Division, I would say that this is a similar to the Oliver Borkstrand deal with Columbus made this with Seattle, which was a, a third and fourth round pick. I think that that's what uh, Besser gets anywhere else but with the Flames. I think it's going to cost a little bit more than that uh, because it's a division rival and potentially a playoff rival. Just to me, I think with the acquisition cost, it doesn't make sense for me to, to the Flames should be in on Brock Besser. Yeah, Calgary realistic. Yeah, Calgary realistically needs a top nine scorer. Um, whether Matthew Phillips, uh, he can emerge as that. Or, um, like, even if he does, I think the Flames could still use another guy um, to generate some offense because uh, with everybody currently struggling a little bit, like, they just need options. And um, Besser is a right shot, right winger. Um, the Flames really don't have too many of those in the lineup. So from just that standpoint, it makes some sense. But, uh, you know, it, it, years left it, I think deal. that it, mostly it comes down to acquisition costs. And as a, Kevin said, like a, the equivalent of a third or fourth and, you know, maybe a little bit more than that because of the divisional rival makes some sense. Um, he's only 25, so he's lo- same age as Manjapane. Um, so, like, he definitely fits in... Yeah, it's one of those where uh, if like he doesn't work out, then like the the he stays basically at the similar like forty fifty point uh, production. Um, like that's obviously not great use of a- assets, but uh, you also look at uh, some expiring contracts uh, that the team have. Uh, you can reallocate some of that money to. Um, getting Besser, I think that you'd have to include some money going back the other way, like a Dylan Dubé, just to shed some money um, as well in this deal. But I don't think that they want to. I know that a lot of people were throwing out the idea that you could throw Lucic in this as a possibility because that, that, yeah, why? And I'm like, why would, no, why would, <laughs> Like no, that's not going to happen. Like you, it's, I don't see the money eating part of that happening. Um, I think they, they, if they trade Besser, they, they didn't want to clear the entire six million of it. Like, I agree, but the Flames still got to find four million then. Yeah, the only reason why I would suggest Dubé is because Dubé is at least a serviceable player that's roughly worth what he's getting paid. So like you know him being at a two point three. That's more or less, you know, yeah, and the Flames can. It's just uh, complicated at that rate. And um, Kevin, when the Besser deal was signed, were Canucks fans thinking there's a good deal, bad deal? What was the thought in Vancouver? I don't think, I think it was a little bit of an indifference. I thought, I think, I think people said, yeah, that's, that's good. 
The one that raged everybody was the JT Miller one because it was an eight-year one, and that, that didn't make sense. I mean, now you're in a situation in Vancouver, too, where it's quite likely now you're trading Bo Horvat, who is third in the league in goals with 19, and because he's a UFA. Um, yeah, and I... I don't know. I I mean, it just with with what he's been at this year, I just don't. I mean, there's a hope that he can get back to where he is, and I certainly hope that. And I think he needs a new place of scenery for sure. Um, I guess my question. I just don't know. I spent six and a half million for three years on this guy. Yeah, and and is he giving you anything different than Tyler Toffoli is? That's the question that I would. Have. I would even ask if he's giving you anything more than Dubé at this point. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, yeah, I would say yes to that too. For for the money you're paying him, is he giving you more than Manjapani? Um, and the I room would not goes silent. Tra- I, I I would not be uh, trading Besser for Manjapani. No, no, I wouldn't either. But I'm just looking at if you're acquiring that much money, are you getting an upgrade on a guy who's cheaper? Yeah. Yeah, and I uh, I think they're about in the same ballpark right at this point, and you know Calgary is um, because of the fact that they're not um, a team that's going to like they the losing Gaudreau and Kachuk like they don't have the guys that can create the offense all by themselves. I think like having a bunch of really good quality players in their lineup uh, will help like just to distribute where like anybody can score at any given time. Um, And having a guy like Besser, it does make sense, but the contract, it's going to be hard for the flames to maneuver that one. Um, And I think that uh, like you might have to get a little creative, like uh, shipping uh, Lucic out uh, for um, whatever, just uh, any team to, (laughs) you know, get rid of that, that cap hit. I don't, um, I don't know about you guys, but I find with this one, and I'm saying this more and more to people who bring up fantasy trade scenarios to me, I like the player. I don't like the contract. Yeah. yeah. I think that, like, he's more of, like, a five-ish million dollar player getting six and a half. And, you know, like, that's not bad. It's just uh, it's hard to navigate with a lot of guys that are kind of in that – Middle if zone. If the Flames are going to take on that much money, I can think of a handful of guys I'd rather take on that much money for. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, to me, I think just we talked a little bit earlier about the uh, missing of Eric Gabranson. I mean, to me, if I was to target anyone on Vancouver from a Flames perspective, I think Luke Shen would be the guy. Um, I think Luke Shen brings a lot of what Eric Gabranson uh, – brings to the lineup. I think, you know, you could argue where he is in the lineup in terms of where he's playing with, but um, to me, to me, he's he's everything that Gabranson was was last year, and I think he'd be a very valuable piece I, and a cheap acquisition and, too. A, and a cheap acquisition cost. And the Flames, I, I do believe, in order for to have a long playoff run, you need eight quality defensemen. I agree. Yeah. So, and I think Luke Shen would be a guy that you. You need I I I I I, just, I still I, am not convinced though, Kevin, that we don't get Chillington back this year. So I think we got to wait and see what happens there. Well, even well. with Chillington, I would still argue you could use it. It wouldn't hurt to have a Shen. That's true. Better than because Mackie. we don't even we, we don't know when Chillington A is going to be back, and we don't know the shape he's going to be in when he's back. That's true. Yeah, and and Shen greater than Mackey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I would easily play Shen over Stone right now. I agree. Um, and and what's Shen's yeah, contract? No, and when it comes to Shillington, I think that um, what you'll likely see when, if when he's ready to come back, if he is this season, uh, he'll probably play two or three weeks down on the farm uh, just to get his legs under him before. Yeah, I'd be curious to see if recalled, they can but... if they can put him on a conditioning stint or not. Yeah, well, you can uh, like the golden or uh, Kraken did that with uh, Shane Wright, so um, we'll see. So, Kevin, you wanted to chat this week about goaltending. Well, I think yeah, it's a, certainly a topic for sure in Calgary right now. We had uh, you had the situation where Markstrom said he sucked at hockey, so I think we all were maybe this guy needs a bit of a break. He played, I thought, played really well against Columbus. 
and Daryl didn't like the goals two and four that Vladar uh, play allowed against Toronto. Um, I certainly think we're getting marks from Monday. I think we get marks from the. Re- I think we get marks from the rest of the week. I think that this um, this is the time we were about to go to a, a lot of interconference four point games. Um, you've got marks from Montreal. You've got marks from against his old team against Vancouver, and. Uh, and then you got St. Louis as well, who you're who's battling for a playoff spot. Spot and it was probably similar to the Flames in the sense of trying to figure out what they are at this particular point in time. This would be the time to see where we're at with Markstrom. This, you know, I mean, that's kind of where Matt? I'm at at this point. Uh, yeah, it, it's tough because uh, you don't want to send a message to Vladar of. Oh, you had one start where you gave up five goals and it not necessarily being entirely your fault. Um, you know, like the Leafs capitalize on three power plays, but you know, like if you go back to Markstrom, like entirely this week, it also, it's kind of like, well, you're, you're good enough to play only if you're perfect. And then if you have one bad game, Oh, well, the other guy's going back in, uh, but it's also it's just tough because of the fact where the flames are at because like Markstrom needs to reestablish himself too and he played well against Columbus and yeah it 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 would almost be beneficial to like almost alternate them uh, for a bit like literally one start one start one start one start and until everybody gets going and see how things are because it, it's just kind of tough because you don't want to hit Vladar as well and at the same time and it's it's just awkward I think (laughs) my only my my, my, go ahead Kevin sorry my thing is though too is at what point like we haven't seen Vladar have that lengthy number one stretch and to me still Markstrom is the number one guy Vladar I mean he's playing well and you have to kind of see where you're at with Markstrom and this is probably the week to do it um, because you got a very busy week coming up you got a very busy schedule after this you've got you've got your west your first west coast trip against San Jose Anaheim and LA and you know I know those teams are bad but those teams also have given the Flames trouble over the years as well so you need to kind of see where where you're at at this point with Markstrom um, so that's why I would give marks from the week. I don't think right yeah. now the Flames have a starter. I think the starter gr- job is up for grabs. I think we've seen Vladar play pretty much a whole week, and he looked good. I think we've seen Markstrom falter a bit. I agree. we got to put Markstrom in some point. I'd probably do Montreal, maybe Vancouver. But I think you've got to really evaluate on ice, off ice, practice, everything that's going into these guys, and trust our goaltending department to make the right choice. But I think Calgary got into trouble last year because they relied too heavily on one guy. Yeah, They relied too heavily on just Markstrom. So I think if Vladdy can do it, let Vladdy do it. And let's see what we got there. We, you know, we got to see if this guy is, and I don't want to put too much pressure on him. Maybe he's the next Kiprasov or if he's, you know, the next um, Kari Ramo is this guy, or even David Riddick, is he a starter? Is he a backup? Is he sort of a, you know, a one B like, I think we've got to run Vladdy until not, I don't want to say until he loses, but until his, his good run is over. Yeah, it, it's tough because young goaltenders are. It's hard to get a read on them until you play them enough. And you know, Vladar has looked very impressive through most of his playing time uh, the, the last few weeks. Uh, and you know, like if you look at like the Flames playoffs last year, like after the first round, like Markstrom was basically done because uh, of how having to go mano a mano with Ottinger for seven grueling games where he had to basically be perfect because the other guy was playing a Dominic Hasek <laughs> mode, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's one of those where, you know, like if Ladar had been playing enough it, down the stretch, you know, you could have reliably thrown him in, in game three or game four but like at that point, like he had had only like played one game or two games in like two months, and like that's that's not fair to the guy <laughs> to come in that cold. Yeah. Oh, go stop the two best players in the NHL. Have fun, um, you know. Like it, it's just not feasible, and so it, it's this whole stretch. It is you know like Kevin's right. 
I'm right, and it's hard because we're both right. I'm okay being <laughs> like, the guy. How do you wrong. navigate that? Yeah. Well, it had to come. You're not wrong point. either. Like, everybody's right on this one, and it, it's hard. I think if I <laughs> if I was the coach, I'd put, yeah. I'd put Markstrom in against Montreal. See what you get there. If he looks good, I'd put him in against Vancouver. See what you get there. If he still looks good, put him in against St. Louis and let him earn his way back to the starting spot. But I think if he's not great in any of those, I would sort of default back to Vladar instead of default back to Markstrom, yeah. if that makes sense. What I think we can all agree on is we'll need you will need two goalies for the playoff run. And the, the days of playing a goalie 60 games in a season is over right now. Like yeah. it's just it's just not possible. And Markstrom's got enough wear and tear that you can you just simply can't do it. And it's just, you know, the mental game, no. like like to me. That screamed like marks from saying sucked at hockey screamed a number of issues at me. And I think it's just, you can't be, you can't put him in as much as you have. I agree. Yeah. It, it did scream burnout yeah. and it, you know, and that that's fine. You know, and like thankfully Vladar playing so well has allowed and afforded him some time to recollect himself and you know, confidence with goaltending is paramount. And if you don't have it, you're kind of screwed and you know and y you could see uh, especially like how markstrom's played like it was more like even i think he was getting to a point where okay when am i going to allow the bad goal and instead of you know focusing on being good uh, you know it was more focusing on the negative and he's looked better um but you know, we need to see more and hopefully he can just sort everything out. And the beneficial thing uh, with the relationship that the two goalies have is that they are both very supportive of one another yep, off the, the, like on the ice. Week. And, you know, and I'm just hoping that they're pushing each other to get through. Cause you know, like it, it is a team in this instance. And, you know, like, there's no illusions that Vladar is going to be the permanent starter on this team. Like, you know, for as long as Markstrom's here, he is the de facto starter. But but I think we also have to have figure to... out post-Markstrom. Is it Vladar? Is it Wolf? Like, what is the future of Calgary's net hold? Yeah. But, like, as, like, this current group, like, you know, you're having to make sure that everybody's supportive of each other mm -hmm. and like kind of working together as a team, which we've seen some difficulties with the forwards and the defensemen at times this season, working together as a team as well. And so with those guys working together, hopefully it spreads out throughout the rest of the team and everybody gets going a little bit better. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, guys, uh, not so much news from this week, but we have some news that's a bit of a blast from the past. In 2003, the Edmonton Oilers hosted the Heritage Classic. Uh, they won 4-3 to three over the Montreal Canadiens, and it looks like they may be hosting it again. The, the news out there is that in 2023, the Calgary Flames will be going to Edmonton to play outdoor in Commonwealth Stadium against the Oilers. Um, it should be an October game, so much nicer weather. But I think we're out of retro jerseys for these two teams to wear. We've kind of exhausted both teams' retro looks. Kevin, what do you think? Are you excited for this? Yeah, I am. And I, I think that there's an opportunity here for a couple of things to happen. Um, the, the 2003, that was the opportunity for the Oilers to uh, kind of bring back all the old 80s greats, the Gretzkys, the Messiers, the Coffees. Uh, this is an opportunity now to bring back the Doug Waits, the Ryan Smith, the uh, Bill Guerin's, kind of the the other on the other echelon. side, the Jerome McGinlas. And yeah, exactly. I was about to say the Conroys, the Aginlas, the Martin Tangelinas, um, Robin Regeer is kind of those guys. And bring them out and get them their their shine and their glory. Who does Freddie Brathwaite little... dress for? I don't know. You know, I mean, if Grant Fuhr was to play, who does he dress for? Well, I think well, I think we could say the Fuhr had more success than Oilers. So and who does Dwayne sense. Rollison play for? Well, Rollison would play for the Oilers because he went to the finals with them, right? But yeah, um, yeah, no, I I, I think it's going to be Steve I Smith. Think, that's a good point. Um, and well, I think he's always a Calgary Flame. He just didn't know it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and who who does Glenn Gullickson coach for? And who does he throw a stick at? Which bench does he throw a stick at? So many questions. 
so many questions um but yeah no i think it's gonna be i think it'll be a lot of fun uh and i hope that calgary comes up there and goes up there and um they represent well and yeah i think october it still has the potential to be cold but not too cold yeah uh it'll be fun i think it'll be a, a neat little thing and this is i believe con would be connor mcdavid this is the sad thing about the end whole other topic but for the love of god how is this connor mcdavid's first outdoor game <laughs> They've always skewed more towards the states with the outdoor games. Yeah. Now, that's, what are your thoughts on this? Excited for? Well, you know, because everybody's always amped for the Dallas Minnesota matchups, and you know, Colorado versus whomever they play. Sure. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, I I'm glad that Calgary is playing another outdoor game. It's always nice when ever your team is doing something different um it'll be interesting to see what uh type of jerseys that they'll wear i think that with both teams kind of embracing their past uh, over the last few years with the oilers going back to their original jerseys uh for their home and road and calgary doing the same that i think they might skew maybe going experimental mode and going a futuristic for something different, but uh, the most futuristic I can see them doing is like Blasty versus the Cog. Well, you never know. Like we've seen some rather out there outdoor game uh, ones for the states teams. Uh, so, uh, like I know the Kings had that really weird jersey that they wore a few times after their outdoor game. So. Uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, it'll, it'll, that's always like one of the more fun things about the, that type of a weekend is like, what kind of threads are they going to wear? I like the threads. I like the alumni games and Kevin, you follow the dub. Um, what do you think the chance we get, uh, Calgary Edmonton playing a dub game there? I think that would be a great idea to be honest with you. And I think the WHL could use that exposure. Um, yeah. I wouldn't even be opposed, to, frankly, if they brought uh, Edmonton's farm team and the Calgary Wranglers there well. As they did well. that last like, time the Flames three. played outside. They brought uh, Edmonton's farm team and Calgary's and played them at the Dome. Yep. Yeah, I, I think so. you can make a whole event out of that. For sure. Um, I don't know if you could do – yeah, you can make a whole hockey event out of that, and I think that that would be great. I think it would be a lot of fun, and, you know, um, I still – I think it's great for the the travel for the two cities. I still think the economy – obviously, would be great for both economies as well. So, Yeah, you'll get a lot of Calgary fans going up there. I think, uh, you know, we'd see a – we'd probably see a big C red contingent. Yeah. Well, guys, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, Kevin, we always appreciate having you on the show. We love when we can chat with you. And for those that want to hear more of you, where can they do that? Well, you could, uh, I, we do the, we're going to focus on the, we focus on the Flames and the Canucks. I do a daily news pack. Just started this recently. Uh, just to keep up abreast of all the news going on. Um, of course, especially when you're in podcast format, you kind of tend to miss some of the other things that are going on in the National Hockey League. And they, may or may not affect your team, but what it does, it tells you the trends of what's going on and where really your team is at. Uh, so I do a daily news pack, focus on the NHL, talk a little AHL, WHL, or other things that are going on in hockey as well. So I'll either preview or recap the those. Uh, those will be in the afternoon this week because I'm working evenings, uh, so as opposed to afternoons, which I have been working for the last little bit. Don't you hate and it when then, work gets in the way of hockey? Yeah, stupid work. Um, but... The other thing <laughs> is, um, as well, we we will have our Canucks uh, focus on Monday. Talk about all the issues there, Bo Horvat, Brock Besser, all of what's going on there. And then Thursday, we'll be back to talk about the Flames uh, and see kind of where they're at. This will be a, it, it'll be an interesting week, Montreal again, and a first Flames Canucks matchup. So, will be interesting to see. So you can find us on Twitter at Shifts and Pucks, Facebook.com Shifts and Pucks. YouTube.com shifts and pucks. Subscribe wherever you get your audio, um, as well as on the Area 51 Sports Network. And you can follow me on Twitter at K E V O L E. That was a mouthful. Take a drink, take a breath. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only thing we have left to do is our predictions. And as always, we predict how the week is going to play itself out. Uh, last week, the Flames won against Arizona, Minnesota, lost Columbus and Toronto. So pretty much won at home, lost on the road. I pretty much predicted that. Um, I thought I didn't think we'd get the one point. I didn't necessarily predict that, but that's okay. So, Matt, I'm starting to catch up with you again. Um, you got a you got a bit ahead of me here. Uh, you predicted that we would win Arizona, Columbus, Toronto, and lose to Minnesota. So, uh, Kevin, if you want to make some predictions this week, you're welcome to. But let's jump in. I'll start with mine. <sighs> I think Calgary's going to have a hard time against Montreal. They tend to play down to poor opponents, and it's just something the Flames tend to do. And I can see them playing down to Montreal. I think they'll beat Vancouver, and I'll be optimistic and say they're going to beat St. Louis. So I'll say uh, win Vancouver, St. Louis, lose Montreal. Matt, how about you? I'm going to go the opposite, say that they're going to beat Montreal and then lose to the other two. Why is that? Uh, they've just been too, a little too sloppy lately. Um, like even the two games they won this week, they were not very good performances by the team. And, uh, like if they had, uh, come out a little bit better, um, against Arizona and were more decisively beating them, uh, I'd say that the, they have a better shot, but both Vancouver and St. Louis are playing well, um, Montreal's bad and like we should have beat them the last time if not for Jake Allen standing on his head so you know it, it's one of those where I, I just uh, I'm not too confident in this team right now uh just because they seem to be getting in their own way a little too much Kevin you want to make a prediction yeah I think they'll beat Montreal um I think they uh I think they'll come back with a good effort I honestly don't know what to make about the Canucks. I don't know what to get from one day to another. I don't know what you'll get from one shift to another. I don't know what you'll get from one period to another. But I think I, I'm going to say Vancouver beats Calgary this week because it just seems as though the, the way things are rolling. Uh, I think Calgary beats St. Louis. I think the big, big question of that game, though, is do we get a goalie fight? It is Jordan Biddington. He does find a way to get himself involved in things. I don't want a goalie fight. Like, I think Calgary's, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to see Markstrom fight, and I think Bennington I will take down Vladar. I, I hope I don't want to see it either, but, man, George, he he's just off the rails. I can see Bennington trying to fight. You know, honestly, that's why you would, I, I would dress Lucic for that game and just tell him to go bug the goalie a bit. Not, not enough to take a penalty, but just. Bug him. <laughs> you know Just what's actually him. significant about that game? That will be Calgary's first game against St. Louis since that whole hell of Baloo in the playoffs. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. I guess that'll be right. fun. Yeah. 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 That'll, that'll be fun. <laughs> That's why you keep me around. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I knew there was yeah. a reason. <laughs> Besides, this good tell Codra to go bug him. <laughs> Kevin, we'll keep you around as long as you keep clearing waivers to come on our show. All right. Well, hey, hey, I'll keep clearing waivers. All right. He says now until the Evan guys pick him up. Yeah. Then you just hear Kevin in the background. No. That's, that's when I will call them and say, I'll trade you for Kevin. Well, what do we get in return? I will consider you in the future. <laughs> yeah. Not favorably, just consider you. Yeah. <laughs> no, always, always great to be on. A lot of I fun. won't tell you when, but at some point in the future, I'll consider you. Yeah. Maybe tomorrow, yeah. maybe a year from now. But it will be in the future. That's right. All right, we should get out of here before we start <laughs> making other trades. And I'd start trading Matt to a Phoenix podcast or something. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, do you want to take us out? Uh, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.